What is up, baseball fans? For two weeks in a row, we've had this crossover. Locked on Padres, locked on Mets. Two teams that are similar in some ways and some ways that we don't like because we're going to talk later about the collapses both of these teams had. But I am joined today by Javi Reyes, host of Locked On Padres. For you Locked On Padres listeners, I am Ryan Fickelstein, host of Locked On Mets. What's going on today, Javi? What's going on, man? Look, look, we've had a lot of collapses. I think collapse has been kind of in sports, whether it be the collapse of labor negotiations, whether it be how about them Cowboys over this past weekend? <laughs> how about that? That was elite. Oh, man. I, don't you, it's just like, do you ever get sad when, I mean, both of us, we probably don't like Boston teams, right? But then isn't it kind of reassuring that there are those teams and enemies and awful, like, just the clear villains in sports that will not let you down and still manage to lose. Like, yeah, the Patriots keep winning and whatnot and keep finding ways to win. But then the Dallas Cowboys keep finding ways to lose. It's just every now and then you have to remember that sports is a give and take kind of business. It gave me a lot this weekend as a longtime Giants fan (laughs) to see the Patriots lose just because everyone hates the Patriots. To see then the Giants and the Eagles both get eliminated within a couple of hours. Mm. It was fantastic. It was was a great Sunday for football. It really was. Pretty great. Not the best games in a lot of blowouts. But you know what? Uh, take it. That Dallas game was just, I love it, man. I love it. I keep blaming the refs now. That'll take you to greater pastures. <laughs> I think the expanded playoff in baseball might add some more exciting games than the expanded playoff in football. It seemed like uh, extra teams wasn't great yeah. for the NFL, though. I guess they got extra games. But Yeah, because baseball, at least, like yeah. you might get to see some really cool stars in there. You know what I mean? In football, it's just a little bit, yeah. like, unless, it's, it's a very rare occasion. Right, where you're like, oh man, we would have really liked to have that meh team, but maybe their quarterback is awesome. Um, I remember the Marlins bounced the but Cubs in the case of baseball, in, the, uh, in that shortened season. The Marlins, I mean, you know, any team. I mean, hey, not shout good, out Florida, man. They got some cool players over there. Trevor Rogers, Jazz has Chisholm, killing it. Yeah, a lot of pitching. It's going to be, uh, they'll be better <laughs> this year, but let, let's get into the main conversation here. Let's do it. There's two shortstops in baseball that are making $340 million. Uh, one of those yeah. making 341 because Tatis got a oh, deal yeah. first. So you had uh-huh. to make sure how, how ridiculously petty is that? I, I love it so much, but it, it is hilarious that that, that $1 Look, million dollars more. <laughs> the Padres listeners, I've said this to them. I think we're on, I'm good. I'm on good terms with them. I, support every puerto rican player uh i this has been a thing for me every single player is is my lindor has been my favorite with the exception he's now that tatis finally debuted because if everybody remembers lindor has been in the league longer uh and i adore francisco lindor we need more stuff like that it was the most petty <laughs> dumb thing ever and i just would love to know like the reactions from Atisa's <laughs> camp and what have you. I just thought it was incredible. Uh, and that being said, I mean, in fairness, Lindor, you gotta, you're my boy, but a little bit of an underwhelming uh, 2020, 21 season, I must say. Yeah, well, it was a, a down year for Lindor, but I think this is a little bit more of an interesting conversation than it looks mm-hmm. like on the surface because everyone can concede that if they're both healthy, I mean, Tatis can be the best player in baseball. So, I mm-hmm. get the argument for why Tatis is the better contract. I'm talking about the contracts more than just mm-hmm. you know what they can do in a given season. But mm-hmm. who's really going to be better for the next 10 years? I look at Lindor, and he did have the oblique strain this year. Technically played less games than Tatis this past season, but throughout his career, he's always been healthy. Tatis, mm-hmm. three years into his career, we've seen a lot of injuries. I think there is a case to be made that Francisco Lindor might stay on the field more and could be more productive over the next 10 years. What do you think? Absolutely. And here's the other thing, guys. Like, I think we're all, we can all be very prisoners of the moment when it comes to, when it comes to baseball players. Cause like there wasn't, everyone wasn't always saying Freddie Freeman was the best first baseman, right? Like everyone wasn't always saying that um, Tatis now is the best shortstop or whoever the heck at third base. It was Chris Bryant. Like these things can go all over the place. For all we know, Tatis could have that for some reason, his best seasons were his first two. That could happen, right? I doubt it. I don't think that any of the metrics suggest that. I don't think if you just literally just watch him, this guy yeah. just looks like he's Griffey. Um, <laughs> like, just 100%. He just looks like he's Ken Griffey Jr. Um, with Lindor, it's possible. I think that the big, my big thing for this would be Tatis is still, like, 22 years old, while Lindor, not old, is, what is he going to be, like, 29, 28? I forgot how old he yeah, is, Yeah, he'll, he'll be 28. Right now. Yeah, 28. So you could make the argument that 
maybe Lindor's health things won't get easier. Now, granted, this was kind of the first time he's had any health things, but you know, now, once you get to that dirty thing, would it surprise you if Lindor, it's like, oh, maybe that, that Iron Man status that he had before starts to fade away a little bit. While Tatis, maybe this was the worst of it. I'm not thrilled. Uh, you know, I, I get that it's more complicated than this, but, you know, he's electing probably not to get the surgery on his shoulder, which flared up a bunch of times this year. So I don't know how Tatis is going to manage through that. But I will say it's you got to be careful with giving players the injury bug t- uh, title when it's only been a few years into their career. Um, A good example of this is Manny Machado. I mean, Manny Machado was very, very injury prone. And now, since I think it is 2017, only two other players in Major League Baseball have played more games than him. So it is a little bit early. We don't know for sure. Granted, the shoulder thing is literally right there. It's like a ticking time bomb, apparently. It's just you never know when it's going to get go uh, blow up. But I would say that we'll have to see how it pans out. But I'm not ready to label this guy as Tulowitzki. Uh, just yet, because I think that yeah. that's a little bit unfair. I think that the shoulder thing can be remedied, and also I think you get get better at defense. Doesn't have anything to do with the injuries necessarily, but I think you get better. Well, those are really the only two arguments you can make for Lador, right? It, it's it's the injuries yeah. and the defense. Uh, I, I still think over the next ten years, defensively, he's going to be better. But look. It's hard for me to sit here and actually make the case for Francisco Lindor over, like you said, <laughs> the potential little next Ken Griffey Jr. when it comes to his offensive mm-hmm. profile. But the one thing I will say is that, you know, to try to get you on my side again, kind of putting this argument, you know, to rest, I would say, though, that the gap between these players uh, isn't as great as some would make it seem, and that Lindor still deserved that contract because he was the best shortstop in baseball from, I think it was 2016 yeah. all the way through. When it comes to war, he's been the best shortstop in baseball. So I, I mm-hmm. hate the people that are now trying to to come into to Francisco mm-hmm. Lindor and come into his bag and take his money and say he doesn't deserve it. He earned that money for being the best shortstop for so long. Yeah, and and granted, like I said, it could be a prisoner of the moment thing. If Lindor comes out this year, bats 270, 350 on base, and hits 30 bombs and plays excellent defense, I think that, like, once again, we're going to be like, oh, well, Tatis is great, but don't get me wrong. It's not like Lindor is, like, that far behind him or whatever. Like, that could absolutely happen. And it could also happen that he's just a okay, decent, solid at bat who gives you great defense and that maybe the dead end ball like actually really affected him and he's not going to be able to lift as many home runs and whatnot. Maybe he'll be able to swipe bags, but like it's possible. I think that it's, it's fair though. Cause remember before this year, a lot more people would have, I think had this conversation. I think still people might've taken Tatis, but you know, now everyone's saying Trey Turner's better. Now everyone's saying uh, Corey Seager's better. Now everybody's saying, so I think people do have to slow down and realize that after one season that can change our outlook on a lot of guys. Uh, unless you're Mike Trout, I think, is like the only one that everyone's like, no, 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 he's he's still probably the best yeah. <laughs> when he's playing. He's pretty ridiculous. I think there's just this overcorrection now where now there's people that would say that Lindor's not even a top 10 shortstop. And I, I look yeah, at, yeah. you know, you know, Tatis is, is on this huge upward trajectory, so it's hard to, to compare him to Lindor. But if you look at Lindor to Corey Seager and Carlos Correa and this, this recent shortstop you know, class that went into free agency – I don't think that these guys are, are you know, head and shoulders better. I think they had better years, but it, I, I just hate the recency bias of looking at this past season and forgetting the five he put up before that. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's just he's been great. Like you said, 2016 to 2020, give him a second. This is going to be definitely a very big prove it for him this year. I think there's going to be a lot more pressure on Lindor this year because we're starting to wonder. I mean, we, we, I think we joked about it on the last podcast about DJ LeMahieu, like he got paid and now all of a sudden he's not looking very good for the Yankees. That could be a problem. I still think Lindor will be good. He's a very talented player. He's got the swagger. He's fun. I think you got a preview of that in the three home run game against the oh. Yankees. That was just, yeah, there you go. There, He's getting excited. Like, oh, so just man. saying that got him excited. Dude, um, I think moments like that show you. He's still capable of it. Um, but, yeah, it's not – guys, don't, don't forget. You know what I mean? It's so easy to forget. You know how many people are like, give me Wander Franco over him right now? And it's like, I love Wander Franco, but also he's played like 40 games. You know what I'm saying? So, like, why are we labeling him a superstar already? Like, give it a second, guys. We don't know for sure how these things are going to pan out. I know it's not the popular thing to say. I know it's so much more popular to go out there and say Wander Franco is going to be a top five player in baseball next year. It's so much more fun to be hyperbolic. But in reality, we don't know. What if Wander gets hurt? 
What if all of a sudden he's the new Tatis? We don't know. And that's kind of the fun part about sports, right? But you know uh, what we do know? Thing with... <laughs> What'd you say? I said, but do you know what you we do know, Ryan? Oh, if you want I, to make your, your point. No, no, it. no. I'm curious. I, you got me intrigued. What What do we know? <laughs> we know what is, like, we don't know necessarily the best short stops and everybody at the same position. But what we do know is when it comes to the position of the best protein bar in oh, all yeah. the galaxy, Mr. Ryan Finkelstein, we know that that title goes to Billy's Jones. New Year's, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier or just wanting to eat things that are just better, uh, it's just a general. If you like them, that they taste better. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar and maybe even better than a candy bar, guys. I mean, it's just... It's fantastic. I love these things. I talk about it in our Locked On chat literally all the time, begging for packages to be sent. Send me more. Give me the new flavors. And that's the other thing I like about them is they have such a great variety of flavors from, you know, your chocolate stuff, right? They got, what else we got here? We got raspberry, cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, coconut almonds. The favorite of the Locked On folk is, what is it, coconut brownie chunk. A lot of people like, uh, I like apple almond crisp, and they've got like new Christmas flavors, eggnog, gingerbread. That's why I like about them a little bit of that Ben and Jerry's type of energy where they just have a great variety. And like I said, very healthy for you. Most built bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs, guys. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Remember, guys, that is promo code LOCKED15 at built.com for 15% off. Go check it out. All right. I mean, I, I got to say I'm hungry now. I, I want a built bar. I haven't had breakfast yet. <laughs> I'm going to have to grab one after this show. Uh, so, you know, as we move off of the Lindor to tease argument that uh, – I was doomed to to lose on that one. Uh, let, let's talk about these two teams because, I mean, so similar their past seasons. In the first mm -hmm. half, the Padres were 53-40. and 40, The Mets were 48-40. and 40. In the second half, the Padres were 26-43. and 43, The Mets were 29-45. and 45. Uh, Both had winning percentages under 400 in the second half. I remember mm -hmm. there was a matchup between these two teams. I want to say it was in – maybe late May where it was like, these are the two sexy teams with the big off yeah. seasons with the big stars, you know, mm -hmm. watch them, you know, they're going up against the DeGrom Dodgers versus the Snell. Oh, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. You have to grab versus Snell Darvish. I yeah. remember had a pretty decent game. All of that is to say that there was all this hype built up around these two teams being maybe the next up in the national league. And they both mm -hmm. just fell completely mm -hmm. flat on their face. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's, it's such a variety of things. And I think that the bottom variety thing, though, like you said, I mean, my team, 67 and 50 on August 11th. That's what the Padres' record was. They were still in the driver's seat. Don't get me wrong, they had blown some series. They had these weird games against the Marlins where, like, the umpires maybe may or may not have been paid by the opposing team. It was, it's, it's fine. It happens sometimes. But there's – you. You lose some of these almost on the wall when you look back at it, where they kept losing to really competitive teams. A lot of Padres fans uh, in my mentions were mentioning, like, why do we keep losing to too many of bad teams? You know what I'm saying? But then you looked at, well, they keep beating the Dodgers. They keep beating teams like the Reds. And then everything just fell by the wayside. And what I thought was so interesting is when you look at both of these teams, it's really incredible how much every single player underperformed with the exception of a couple, right? So if you look at the Tatis thing, obviously he was fantastic, but injured. He had some injuries and whatnot. Manny Machado, great. Jake Cronenworth, great. Joe Musgrove, great. Like, Ryan, did you know that Tommy Pham had a WRC plus of like 29? With it? I bet you the stat for now four months now. Like, what? <laughs> Tommy Pham was like a fringe top 20 outfielder for like four years. He had some good playoffs moments he was with the cardinals and then he literally like and it wasn't just like off it was just all these down the middle pitches he just swung through them and it made me go mad let me tell you trent grisham he couldn't hit worth a damn either he was he was just terrible all these guys hassan kim couldn't hit he's an extreme pull hitter he couldn't hit, hit that uh experiment seems to not have worked they bring in adam frazier uh adam <laughs> scott from friggin whatever that show is um 
Parks and Rec, I think. And he just, he was awful. Like, what an acquisition that was. He could have played the, the field all that well. And he hit like a buck 60 for those first two weeks with the Padres. Just, it's amazing that nobody played average. You know what I mean? And I think that was kind of the same thing with your team, where with the exception of maybe the polar bear and maybe one other guy that I'm not remembering right now, like Conforto down year, Lindor down year, Dom Smith down year, Jeff McNeil, who literally only hits for batting average and on base down year. Um, you know, and, and then they had the Carrasco thing took a little bit longer before he got back into the rotation. Obviously, the DeGrom injury. It just feels like both of our teams, we couldn't get guys to just play average you didn't have to have career years necessarily just guys weren't playing up to what their pedigree is and should be and i think that that's what contributed to the just total total sadness that was the second half of both our teams i mean it's a sad year when i think the mets best second best offensive player technically if you really dive deep it was probably lindor but because of how much you had the expectations for him their yeah. second best offensive player was jonathan vr which was hilarious on my show because I spent th – there was a game like first two weeks of the season where I think they were playing the Phillies and VR – the Mets like were losing like 7-1. And VR has all of these meaningless hits and, and like racks up stats at the end of the game. So I go on a rant. Like this is who he is. He's the guy mm -hmm. that when he was on the Orioles, he, he put up a bunch of empty stats. He's never going to help you win. And then he had like three walk-off hits in a row. <laughs> It was it was the so that so that my, my listeners made me buy a Jonathan VR jersey, which I still proudly own. Hope he comes back. He's my mm -hmm. guy. But anyway, that was the year. It was a weird season for the Mets where so many of their top players couldn't come through. Some of these random guys, I, I mean, their best string of success was a time where James McCann was playing first base. You had Khalil yeah. Lee and Cameron Mabin <laughs> striking out every other at bat, and they were winning two to one games because the pitching was so good. DeGrom gets hurt, the whole season is crippled. But when I look ahead to next year, these are the two teams that I think have the best opportunity to bounce back in a massive way. Mm -hmm. I, 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 really I absolutely so. agree. I absolutely agree. And I think there's I think there'd be two reasons for that. One, I think just fundamentally positive regression. I think that they had so many guys that were so below average that just by the law of averages, you kind of have to be like, all right. Trent Grisham's going to hit 260. Like, he's going to hit 250. Tommy Pham, you have to not be the worst, like, literally one of the worst qualified hitters when it comes to driving guys in, in all of baseball if they do elect to bring him back in. I know there's rumors about Castellanos and what have you. We'll have to see. And the same thing kind of with the Mets. And not to mention, I, I will say one difference, though, between the two teams. One difference is that the Mets, I mean, they're off season. I know the Max Scherzer thing is awesome. I have been one of the people who's a little bit uh, not not – cynical is, is a little bit too strong of a word on the signing, but I just think in fairness, there are very few pitchers who have ever kept up what he's done at his age. That being said, screw it. I'll take a, I'll take a gamble on, on Max Scherzer. I think it was a good move by the Mets, but then it's like you bring in Eduardo Escobar. That's not too bad. Mark Canna, very sneaky, good player. Mark Canna, awesome Instagram, big time foodie. Uh, love him. And then Starling Marte, who over the course of the last 162 games, one of the most productive players in all of baseball. You do those type of moves, and I don't know how you can't be ex more excited about the Mets. It looks like they're making more additions to their team, while the Padres, you're just hoping that a lot of their additions that they made to the team after the 2020 uh, offseason uh, improve this year. They don't necessarily have as much wiggle room for their roster. I don't think that you should be expecting that team to go out and sign uh, Chris Bryant to a multi-year deal. I don't necessarily think that that's going to happen. We'll see. We'll see. There's a lot of cards because, as you know, Ryan, as you know, both of our teams, they like making moves. A.J. Preller, the wheeling and dealing king. It doesn't always work out, but, like, is there really a trade with the exception of the shortstops we just talked about that, like, would really shock you? I don't think so. I'm throwing it all out there. Like, I don't think that – I just think that with A.J. Preller, he – is ready to deal. I, I really do, and I think that he's ready to deal, guys. It would not surprise me, kind of, any move that they make uh, for the most part. And we're going to have to see how that translates whenever the heck we get baseball back, uh, could, which could be in July. I don't know. But for right now, uh, I think both teams, there's optimism. I really do. The, it's below 500 teams. I, I just don't buy that. There's too much talent on both ball clubs. Yeah. No, no I agree for sure. And since you mentioned when the season's going to start, have you checked Bet Online yet? Do they have an over under or how many games we're gonna get? We were talking before. I'd send the over under at one twenty. I don't know what Bet Online has, but th that's where I would go right now. Uh, what would yeah, you take? I don't the, know. The I over haven't. the under? 
I have it, but I do love going to bed online for checking all these things. But I would probably yeah. take the over, but I, I don't feel good about it. You know what I'm saying? I don't feel good about it whatsoever. It's like when I don't feel good about betting against Tom Brady. You know what I mean? Like, will I bet against him this weekend? Probably because I'm an idiot. But do I feel good about it? No, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, and I know you're going to go to bet online, which would like to wish us all a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Bet online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. It's a new year. They got a new updated desktop and mobile website. So if you sign up today, make sure you use our promo code locked on to receive your 50% welcome bonus from football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers. For 2022, Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. So, as we continue to talk about this upcoming season, that is interesting to me that the Padres have sort of already been swinging for the fences for a couple years now at the acquisition that they've made. And I am curious what they do from this point on. Is there mm-hmm. other tweaks that they make? Is there anyone that they're going to try to trade? I know right now for the Mets, there's some rumor names on the block. Are, are there certain players that are trying to get out of town to try to mix up this roster, or are they just going to run it back and expect, like you said, you know, that positive regression back to the mean? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the guy who plays first base for the Padres, he was in a lot of trade rumors in the sense that they were clearly trying to move him on. Locked on Mets fans, for those, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Ryan can say it, but a bit of mine is I no longer say the name of the Padres' first baseman because he is... I don't think it's really a question anymore that he's the worst contract currently in baseball. I don't really think that there's like a debate there. I know that there are some bad ones out there like a Strasburg. Um, but like when that contract was given, at least people were like, yeah, Steven Strasburg's good. When it was given to the guy who's playing first base for the Padres, it was like, uh, hopefully he'll be good. <laughs> so it's like, that's usually not a, a good place to be. They could move him potentially, but it would require probably sending another prospect. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. And I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to happen because their farm system depth is a little bit gone. And I think that's the big part about the team is that while AJ probably is the wheeling and dealing King, the farm system, you, they don't have as many assets to maneuver and have as much flexibility as they did before. Uh, at one point, they had the best farm system, arguably in baseball history, uh, according to a lot of scouts. They just had so much stuff. And while they still have those top-level guys, they still have Abrams, they still have uh, Luis Campizano, they still have some, hopefully, uh, Mackenzie Gore, and they got Robert Hassel, but then the depth, it just completely falls off after that. And I think that that's one of the problems, you know, right? and that's kind of the two philosophies in trading uh, farm systems. Do you give up the one super good prospect, or do you give up bulk packages? Padres elected to go with the with the latter, and that's fine, but you need to have uh, a return on your investment. And you, Darvish, fell apart in the second half. Blake Snell... I think is going to be awesome next year. I, I really do. I think that he focused more on the fastball slider, but I think that in terms of improving the team from here, it's going to be tricky. I think we'll have to see what they do with the guy at first base. And then in left field, do they go and get like some random type of guy or do they get Tommy Pham again on the dirt cheap because he had a bad season. So if you did want to go that direction, I wouldn't hate it because it wouldn't cost much. Or do they go the Castellanos route, which is what I know a lot of Padres fans have been excited about because he hits for power. He hits consistently just as an offensive threat. He's great. And I don't think there's any real sign of that slowing down. And this team... 22nd in home runs, 21st in slugging. They could use a home run type of power guy, which is weird coming from the team that was called Slam Diego not too long ago. But I think improving around there. Otherwise, starting pitching, I'm ready to roll. Let's do it. Musgrove's great. I would not be surprised if Darvish finds it back. I think Blake Snell's going to be great. They got Mike Clevenger coming off of his injury. Hopefully, Denelson Lamette can get healthy. There's at least, like, things to be excited about. This isn't the Angels. The Angels, it's like, oh, my God, we need, like, 10 things to go right. The Padres just need guys to play up to what their regular skill level is, and then their pitching staff will be great, just like we saw it was for the first half. And then they were, when they were still, there was hope and happiness, you know? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, you know, to give you another positive that came out of this season, you know, you could have given up prospects for Max Scherzer that you got to keep. I mean, that's nice, right? You do it this again you're really doing this again right now i thought we had a truce right i can't believe this i, I had ben to bring rosenthal it back is a narc <laughs> i'm so mad it ruins 
I mean, I think I think everybody saw my tweets. I don't even do them anymore where I beg AJ Preller to kill me in increasingly violent ways for all the moves that he made. And I did it for that one. I was like, Superman punched me into a black hole. <laughs> and then I remember, I still remember like the oral history of that day that Jeff, uh, Jeff Passan, he didn't tweet anything. And after 20 minutes, when he because usually when he tweets up, it's like it'll be the follow up or whatever. I'm not saying that he's the only source, but he didn't tweet anything. And then 20 minutes went by, and I'm like, why is it past and said anything? This is like the biggest like piece that's moving at the deadline. So I started getting nervous, and then I posted the Spider Man video of me being sad. And it's just, oh my god, man. I mean, it's just the one time it wasn't totally right. You know what I mean? The one yeah. time it was against my team. He's Mike Rizzo's a sleeper agent. Like I, I feel bad for Nationals fans. Like you have a person who's actually working for the Dodgers, and that being said, they still got their asses kicked. So I mean, at least again, that's though, the silver lining, right? In retrospect, I don't know if Scherzer saves your season. I don't think he does. So you know, no. it's kind of like mm-hmm. the Mets, like the Javi Baez trade. If you're talking about a trade at the deadline, the Mets actually hit nothing but home runs. Rich Hill, they get him mm-hmm. for nothing. The guy was great. I mean, shockingly, you have yeah. that trade. Trevor Williams pitched really well for the Mets. Javi Baez. Put up cesspitous like numbers. It's just the team yeah. around him was terrible. So sometimes when you trade for rentals, it doesn't work out. And you know, I, I think yeah. in the end, look at the Braves, know, man. The Braves traded for all players that had really bad first halves, and then they were awesome for them in the second half. So like, the the trade deadline stuff not always. I think he would have been great, but at the same time, like you said, everyone was falling apart. I don't know if they make the playoffs anyway. If that happens, um, maybe it stops things again. We can't be robotic about this stuff. We don't know what happens when he's in the locker room. We don't know what that energy feels like when you just, you know, that Mad Max is going out there and he's giving you seven innings, six Ks, no more than two runs or whatever, right? Like, if, if that happens, maybe it changes the outlook a little bit. But also, I just think that there's too many pieces that fell apart for us to know for sure. Um, but nonetheless, what I do know for sure is that that, that um, just an unprovoked strike Yet again from Ryan Finkelstein. <laughs> like, just just unbelievable. Like, at least last time I set up the volley, this time it was just completely unwarranted. I can't oh, believe I just, it. Was just terrible. It was just terrible. the whole time. I was just like, all right, where can I get this jab in there? And, you know, the door was cracked the slightest bit open. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm plowing through it's again. It's going to be five years from there. now that you're going to be like, you know, I mean, yeah, the Padres have a, a great reputation of getting star starting pitches at the deadline and it, it not going haywire. I, I know it. I know it. Look at that little smile hey, of yours. <laughs> you know, maybe at, at 44 years old, Max Scherzer will get traded to the Padres and, and it'll finally come full circle. <laughs> I think he'll still be around. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, and then the finally the age thing will catch up to him, right, when he gets to the bottom. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm, I'm nervous it's going to happen with the Mets. I am. I'm nervous. I Mets, think you get a, fr- a good first year. But it's it's so. it's scary, right, because it's the Mets, and these things don't often pan out for them when they sign these guys. But it's a decent gamble. I just think that what you should tell the fans is if this doesn't work out, no one's allowed to get mad that they signed yeah. him because everyone was jazzed when they did. It's the same thing with the Yankees fans in LeMahieu. Not a single Yankee fan was mad when they re-signed him with that deal, so you can't really get upset. So, <laughs> Javi, you know better than this. You can't expect New York sports fans to be accountable. You just can't. <laughs> Dude, no chance. sports Twitter out of control lately. We need baseball back. We really do. We do. Like, I think people are losing it. Just these mock trade proposals. Padres fans are trying to trade every prospect right now. It's just – it's it's madness. It's madness, and it's, it's kind of the Wild West, and I think it reminds me – a lot of just what happens when you don't have hope. And I don't want to be in that kind of zone for too long um, because yeah. I think that our two teams can be really good next year. And Hey, and just, if you look at it this way, look at some other teams that improved this year. St. Louis was a lot better this year. Um, who, who was bad in the last year? I'm trying to find San Francisco. Obviously they didn't make the playoffs. They were a sleeper. Clearly um, you look at Seattle, they were a sleeper. They ended up improving dramatically. Um, and then you look at the Red Sox. They were a sleeper. They improved dramatically. Every year, it doesn't just translate. There's always those teams that come out that you don't expect. Like So next year, uh, Atlanta could have a down year. We don't know. It could happen. And then maybe they vault ahead of uh, Philadelphia and Atlanta. That could absolutely happen. Or maybe Miami uh, jumps into the span of things. But it's never like replica for replica the same thing as last year. So always keep that in mind that even though you don't see it right now, there's going to be a team out there that we weren't expecting that improves next year. And why not be the Mets or the Padres? I think the, the one thing about these two teams is that because of the star power, they're going to have expectations, which, uh, you know, it puts mm-hmm. them in this weird spot where they can almost only disappoint, right? If they if they actually win, people are going to say, well, that's what they were supposed to do last year. 
Uh, if they mm-hmm. lose again, it's like, all right, see, we told you these guys are frauds. But we will see how that all plays out. Thank you, as always, Javi, for joining me. Always a lot of fun when we get to talk. Uh, why don't you tell my listeners where they can find your work? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Javipeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Up to all sorts of nonsense on there. And then at L-O underscore Padres for the podcast account on Twitter where there's a bunch of Padres-centric stuff. Although I do do that for my own account. Just want to keep people uh, notified because I do tweet some silly things for my personal every now and then. And then on YouTube, Lockdown Padres. Check me out there. We're nearing 200 subscribers. Not as dominant and as obliterating a force as the Lockdown Mets YouTube channel. But we still try to get it done over there. Um, and the Bob Melvin News don't worry, folks. There's there's going to be news left. Once we get out of this lockout, I'm very certain that we have a lot to look forward to and more free agent breakdowns because there's still a lot of free agents left, like the aforementioned Nick Castellano. So, um, yeah, man, just just vibing out here and trying to, trying to hang in there. Hang tough. That's right. And for the Padres listeners, if you're curious, you can find me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Find Locked On Mets wherever you get locked on Padres. Thank you for making this your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out, if not Locked On Padres, Locked On Bets, hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling, where you can get your daily picks, blowout specials, wrong team favorite picks, and Lee Sterling's lock of the day. You can follow Locked On Bets wherever you get podcasts.